السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم جزاكم الله خيرا to all of you for being here may Allah سبحانه وتعالى put بركة in this and accept it from us Inshallah for the next three weeks we are going to be exploring the topic of الأدب أو الأخلاق mannerisms, etiquettes and so on Inshallah, the way that I'm planning to do it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best if we're going to be successful in it or not, is that today we are going to focus on like just defining the importance of akhlaq, making it clear why we should even care about it, and then touch on the manners of the believer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then next week when we come back, we will touch on manners that a person should be having with himself, and manners that he should be having with his family. And then from there, we'll talk on manners that they should be having with the general community. So this is the plan for the three weeks, inshallah. If there are tweaks here and there, and uh, like if, if, if changes happen, uh, we leave it up to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that, inshallah, I would like to get started. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-akhlaq. This is a word in Arabic that comes from the same root words as khuluq or khalq. So creation, you get from it akhlaq and you get from it so many other words. And when you look into the books of definitions like dictionaries of the Arabic language and you look at akhlaq, they tell you that when you look at a person's physical features, they tell you about the outside of a person. So how tall they are, you know, how, what the, the face looks like, how broad the shoulders and so on. These give you a picture into the type of person this individual you're looking at is. And then khuluq or akhlaq, it is what a person has on the inside. So what are the things that you find inside of the person that they show you on the outside? And what you see on the outside, it is always almost a reflection of what is on the inside. So what you find inside of a person, you will see it on the outside. Meaning, if a person has khair, if he has goodness inside of his heart, you will see it on the outside. Khair will come from them. And the opposite is also true. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he outlines his message for us. The reason why he was sent very simply. And he says, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ That I was sent, I was sent to come and perfect moral characteristics. The job of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ Take from their wealth so you could do two things. Their sadaqah take from them so you could do two things. The first one is that you are going to purify them and then you are going to cleanse them. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent to complete this job of perfecting moral characteristics. And how could he not be the one to be sent when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells him, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That you indeed the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are the one that has the greatest of manners, the best of akhlaq. You are the one that has it. And you know for you to really understand the virtue of this verse, or the virtue of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is really to look at the word Azim and understand who it is coming from. This is not you and I saying that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had great akhlaq or amazing akhlaq. This is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala not only saying that he had great akhlaq, but like this is perfection of akhlaq. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you wanted Ibn Al-Kathir Rahimahullah, he comments on this verse and he asks a question. He says, what does it mean for the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa to have the greatest of akhlaq? He says, he reports the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha when she's asked by one of the students, can you describe to us the akhlaq of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And the answer was very simple. She said, his, his akhlaq was the Quran. So Ibn Kathir, he says, this answer tells you that the person that was closest in fulfilling all of the commands that you find inside of the Quran and the most perfect in fulfilling them was the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the one that stayed the furthest away 
from the sins or from the prohibitions that were found inside of the Quran was the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when Allah says he had the best of akhlaq, that he had the most amazing of it, he says this is what akhlaq is. That a person, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has outlined for us all of the praiseworthy akhlaq or mannerisms, etiquettes that a person should have inside of the Quran and that a person follows it. But does not follow it really in a way of I decide what is good and I decide when it is good, but in the way that it was shown to us by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to emphasize good akhlaq so much to the companions that his last messages to them would focus on them and their akhlaq. One of the last messages that he gives to Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, who he is not going to see after this, he says to him, Ya Mu'adh, ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wherever you might be, whether it is in private or whether it is in public, وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا And follow up a bad deed with a good deed so that you could erase it. وَخَالِقِ النَّاسِ بِخُلُقِ حَسَنَ And when you are dealing with the people, when you are interacting with the people, deal with them in the best manners. In this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, really you get like the purpose of this religion. We know that we ha there, there is a type of connection or there is an alaqa between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's like some rights that we have to give to Allah and some rights that Allah has to give to us, right? So what is the right that we have to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt. Have the fear of Allah, have taqwa of Allah, wherever you are. That's what Allah deserves from you. Then there is something that ourselves, we deserve from ourselves. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا That follow up a bad deed. If you do a bad deed and you oppress yourself, and you transgress on your rights, follow it up with a good deed. And then it comes to as human beings, we have to interact with one another. So what is the basis of you and I interacting with one another? وَخَالِقِ النَّاسِ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ That you deal with the people in the best possible manner. A person who has good akhlaq is not only going to be successful in this life, but also in the hereafter. For example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a hadith that comes to us from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says, سُئِلَ النَّبِيُّ سُئِلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَكْثَرَ مَا يَدْخُلُ النَّاسِ الْجَنَّةِ Like what is the, the biggest thing that allows people to enter Jannah? Like what lets them go into Jannah? And he says, تَقْوَ اللَّهِ وَحُسْنُ الْخُلُقِ That a person has the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have amazing manners. They have the most perfect of manners. This is the most, like if you look at the people that enter Jannah, the things that allow them to enter it the most, these two things. So then he was asked, so what is the opposite? What is أَكْثَرُ مَا تُدْخِلُ النَّاسُ النَّارُ what causes, what causes most of the people to go to the fire? He says, الْفَمُّ faraj, Their tongues and their private parts. This is what causes majority of the people of Jahannam, may Allah protect us from it, from being amongst them. Again, again, you look at this, even in this, it is a sign that husnul khuluq was missing. That a person was not able to protect their tongues and they were not able to protect their private parts. From them having qillatul adab, from having very low manners, very low etiquette, it led them to it. So we can see just from this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the thing that allows the people to go to Jannah, good manners and the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never be with a person that does not have manners. Those two things never come together. The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That all you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you. It has been prescribed upon you so that you can attain taqwa. Like it was for the previous nations. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us about fasting. He says, مَنْ لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ that whoever does not leave off like false testimony, he does not leave off false testimony and testifying with it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no desire, has no need for this person to leave off their eating and their drinking. Meaning like false testimony and lying and using your tongue to cause corruption, it is from bad akhlaq. That person, no matter how long they fast for, no matter how long they leave food off and so on, they will never attain taqwa, they will never attain the purpose of fasting. So taqwa, if a person has it, husnul khuluq is going to come from it. 
A person that's always fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is always thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very easy for them to think, how am I dealing with these people in front of the one that is watching me, in front of the one that sees me? Not only this, really if you look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came with ibadat, when he came with worship, we have four main types of worship that we have, right? You have salah, zakah, sawm, and hajj, right? These are the four like main, main types of worship that we do. If you look inside of the Quran, on all of these four, on all of these four, there's always an attachment to a person while doing them, the need for them to have good akhlaq. Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we already said the verse before, where he tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about zakat. That take from their wealth so that you can purify them and you can cleanse them. Their wealth and themselves from it. So that they could be purified. So that they could have akhlaq. Purification here, what to zakihim, it means internally and externally they're being purified. And when a person has that, he has good akhlaq. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about hajj, he says, Al hajj ashurum ma'lumat. That hajj is done in the, in the known months. فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَتَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ That a person that has intended to do this, he has told himself, this year I'm going to go and perform hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell him, you know, make sure that you are at Arafah, make sure that you are at Mina, make sure you do this and this and this. He says, if you have intended to do this, فَلَا رَفَتَ Do not... Be intimate with your spouses in the process of Hajj. Wala fusuqa. And do not use foul language. Wala jidala. And do not argue with one another. The question comes, why are we being told about this? Right after Allah is telling us, for like the person that has decided, this year I'm going to Hajj. This is the advice that he's been given. That do not be intimate. You know, protect the ihram that you are in. Do not use foul language. And do not argue with one another. Because a the, hajj cannot be complete without a person having husnul khuluq. Zakah could not be complete without a person having husnul khuluq. We already talked about fa fasting, right? Taqwa, and what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said: the need for us to protect our tongues for salah, for our fasting to be accepted. From there, you go to salah. And the entire purpose of salah, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa taala he says, in the salata. That salah protects a person or it makes them far away from al fahsha and al munkar. Whenever you see al fahsha in like inside of the Quran, it is talking about a, the haram things that the body does. So any haram that it does with the body, fahsha. Whenever you see munkar, all of the evil or all of the bad deeds that a person does with their tongue. So the words that come out, this is what you call munkar, right? This is a, like here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, salah is going to protect you from two things, from committing evil with your body and committing evil with your tongue, right? If you want to test your salah, see how it is in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all you have to look at is, is my salah preventing me from al-fahsha? And is it preventing me from al-munkar? Now the Prophet sallallahu understood that the companions cannot just be told, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So what he used to do, he would constantly tell them over and over and over. You know, one of the, the, the greatest blessings of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu was that they got to be with the Messenger sallallahu Like this was, this is their honor to us, right? The companions. What makes them different to us was they were in the company of the Prophet sallallahu now, we know that just like they were given that honor of being with the messenger in this life, they would also look for it to get it in the hereafter. So whenever they would ask the Prophet ﷺ, who's going to be the closest one to you on the day of judgment? Who is going to be the one that is nearest to you? The Prophet ﷺ makes it very simple and clear. He says, Inna min ahabbikum ilayya wa aqrabakum minni majlisan yawm al -qiyama. That the, the one that is going to be the closest to me on the day of judgment and the one that is going to be beloved to me, the most beloved from amongst you to me is going to be the people that have Husnul Khuluq. 
that their manners have reached perfection. He's, he took this, the Prophet ﷺ, to show us the importance of it. He says that the most complete believer, the most complete believer, are the ones that have the best of manners. If you want to see between the believers, may Allah make us from amongst them, who are the ones with, like, that have the highest level of Iman or the most complete Iman? You look at who has the best of manners. And without a doubt from the words of the Prophet wasallam, it is those that have the best of manners. In another hadith, the Prophet wasallam, he says, خيارukum, that the best of you, not in the hereafter, this is talking about in this life, the best of you are those that have the best of manners. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was asked by Abu Hurairah anhu, who are the most beloved people to Allah? Very simple. He said, those that have the best manners. Those that have the best manners, the most beloved people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when you see the companions and the way that they would be with one another, the way that they would interact with one another, the way that they would interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would think, how were they able to, like, to get to this place? You look at somebody like Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, where we know that the malaika were shy in front of him. This is a concept that to this, like, I, I, I cannot understand it. Like, what does it mean for the malaika to be shy in front of somebody? And you have to understand, the malaika are constantly watching us. They constantly see us. Now, shyness, when somebody is shy in front of someone, there are characteristics that they show. For example, the way that we even learn this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one day he's sitting in his house and his shin and a part of his knee is exposed. So he's sitting, like he's, he's laying, like leaning back. And you could see like his, his izar, right? His, his, his ma'wis or his uh, lungi that he has on is up. Someone comes and knocks at the door. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr. And he says, let him in, let him come. And he's just sitting. Then Umar comes and knocks at the door. And he's let in. And then Ali comes and he's let in. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doesn't change. Right, he doesn't change the, like the way he's sitting. They can see his shin and so on. And these are the closest companions to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it makes sense, right? Then Uthman ibn Affan comes and knocks at the door. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, who's at the door? They say, it's Uthman. He gets up and he fixes his, his clothing. He covers himself and he sits. And then Uthman is let in. So Uthman doesn't see what they saw. Aisha radiallahu anha, she, the way that like the companions, they knew that the most virtuous of them was Abu Bakr, right? Like there was no doubt that he was the best of them. So what ends up happening later at night, she's sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. She says, why did I see you not move, like change yourself or fix your clothing when my father walked in? And then when Umar walked in, and then when Ali walked in, but when Uthman walked in, before you let him, you, like you, before you let him in, you had to fix your clothing. And the response that he gave was, should I not have shyness in front of the one that the malaika are shy of? Right? Why? Like the question has to be, why is that? Why is he like that? Why are the malaika shy? You know what this means? This means whenever, and the, the, like the craziest part is, the malaika know that Uthman cannot see them, right? Like none of us can see the malaika. So them being shy, like doesn't even make sense from the fact like he's going to see them. He doesn't see them, right? So wh why are they shy in front of him? And why does the messenger know? Because every time that he would come in, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would see the angels lowering their wings for him. So they wouldn't open out of shyness, they're low lowering their wings. So later on, He's asked, what did you do? Or what do you think you did? For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say what you said. And he doesn't even find out the Malaika are shy in front of him until much later. Right? Aisha is not going and saying, oh, the messenger said this about you. It's only later when they have students and they're spreading this, like the hadith are being spread to the students. Eventually it gets back to Uthman. Right? Eventually it gets back to Uthman. When it gets back to Uthman, they ask, what did you do or what was it that caused you to be in this state? He says, I don't know what it was. 
I don't know what it was. Maybe it is the fact like whenever he would use the bathroom, whenever he would use the bathroom, he would try his most to cover himself even in that state. Now, you have to imagine this is not like this time that we live in where our bathrooms are covered. No one sees me in there. This is my time. This is like in the wilderness. Huh? I don't know why you guys left. Some of you taking too much time in the bathroom? Yes, Allah, make it easy. I said my... <laughs> Uh, I said my time, and then the brother is reminiscing. Huh? It's, uh, <laughs> La ilaha illallah. <laughs> so, uh, so he says, like even in that time, right? You have to think this is they use the bathroom in that, like in the wilderness outside, for him to try to not just cover himself, like he knows he can't cover himself from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, but even from the smallest things to make sure that his aura is not going to be exposed. And because of this, the malaika just felt like. We have to have some shyness in front of him. The Prophet Sallallahu the one that had the best akhlaq, he feels like I need to have shyness in front of this person. And this is where having good akhlaq takes the people. The Prophet Sallallahu he says that a person with good akhlaq, with good manners, he is going to get to the place of a sa'im al-qa'im, the person that is constantly fasting, the person that is constantly praying during the night, one of the easiest ways to get to their level, it is by having good manners, having good akhlaq. Most of us here, maybe the last time that we fast is Ramadan. Right, Ramadan, khalas, it ended, I'm going to wait until Ramadan comes. Qiyamul Layl, I left it with Taraweeh. Even Taraweeh, I don't know if I prayed 30 days, whatever. Right? And we know that like from the most virtuous of deeds that a person could engage in, it is to stand during the night and to fast during the day. Right? Like this is so great, right? and then use this for the future inshallah. This is so great, fasting during the day and sleeping during the night, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divorced Hafsa, Allah told him, you have to take her back. So it canceled out the divorce of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jibril comes to uh, like the day that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells, tells Hafsa to go home, like go to your family and he's divorcing her. She goes home, Umar bin Khattab doesn't know what to do. The greatest of men has divorced my daughter. Like there has to be like some, like what do I do? He leaves to just go pray salah. Jibril alayhi salam comes and he tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, As-salamu yuqri'uka as-salam, that as-salam is giving you greetings. Wa yaqulu lak, raji hafsa. And he's telling you, and obviously here telling you means he's commanding you, take back hafsa. You have to take her back. Why? فَإِنَّهَا صَوَّامَةٌ قَوَّامَةٌ Because she is somebody that is always fasting during the days and she's always fa praying during the night. If this is able to take away the divorce of the messenger, not the divorce of the people, of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, imagine how beloved it is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he didn't want someone that has that description of praying during the night and, 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 and fasting during the day, for them to even feel a type of sadness of going through divorce. Take her back. Why? Because she has these qualities. We, some of us, majority of us are not going to reach this level of being able to pray during the night, stand during the day, right? Or the opposite, can't even say it with my mouth, right? Like this is <laughs> the whole theory, like it, it, it's so foreign to me, I can't even <laughs> properly say it. So, with, I, if I can't reach it with that, the Prophet Sallallahu told him, with good manners, I can reach it. And it is very, very easy for a person. Like when we think about manners, it's very easy. Manners, good manners, what it means? I'll give it to you in two sentences. Alright, I'll give you two sentences. Following every command of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and staying away from every prohibition of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You do that, you have good akhlaq. That's it. Alright, I don't think we even need three weeks for us to go <laughs> into the rest of it. All we want is to come back to, the, to, uh, you know, to these two things. Now, I want to finish like this portion of it with a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You guys ever heard of the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I promise a house in Jannah for somebody. Anybody know? For somebody that does something. Huh? Allahu Akbar. Close. So the first one, the 
The Prophet sallallahu says, I promise a palace in Jannah for a person that leaves off arguing even if they're in the right. So this is the first part of the hadith. The next part says, I also promise a house in the middle of Jannah. So this is like, well, there's nothing low in Jannah, but we'll say this is like regular Jannah. Then middle Jannah and then high Jannah, okay? <laughs> Don't just say low Jannah. <laughs> so then he says, the next part he says, I promise a house in the middle of Jannah for this person. Does anyone know what it is? He says, for the person that leaves off lying, even if they're joking. Even if they're joking, you leave off lying. The Prophet ﷺ has promised you a house in the middle of Jannah. And then he says, I promise a palace in the highest levels of Jannah. Whoever is able to perfect their manners. For the people of good manners, this is what is waiting for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst them. Now we move to, hopefully you understand the importance of having good manners. So it's attached to every ibadah that we do. And of course, really, if you look at like, you, you know, when, when, when we study fiqh, you study them on like two sub chapters, fiqh of all types of worship and fiqh of interactions or transactions with the people. Like this is how it's divided. The second part of it, I don't think like the entire process of it needs good akhlaq, right? The entire purpose needs good akhlaq. Every haram thing that has been spread in this dunya has been due to bad akhlaq, due to things that are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has like made it a blameworthy characteristic. And that's what leads a person to haram, right? All of the good characteristics, they lead a person, good akhlaq leads a person to being good, right? So now, how should our akhlaq be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Like how should we be, our manners and our etiquettes, be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So there's like a few things that we should look at. The first type of akhlaq or etiquettes or mannerisms that a person needs to have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it comes in the name that you and I have because we've had Islam. We are known as Muslims. And what this means is those that have submitted themselves, for lack of a better term, to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whatever Allah has commanded me, I have submitted myself to it and I'm going to try and follow it. Whatever He has prohibited me from doing, I am going to be like to try my best to stay away from it. All right, so this is what it means, a Muslim. So the etiquette that a person has is that whatever has come to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, when it talks about the events of the past, when it talks about the events of the future, when it talks about the events of today, we believe in it. That a person believes in everything that has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it is in the Quran or in the authentic ahadith of the Prophet The other thing is that there is from good manners, is that when a person does come to those things that they find, that they find hard for them to accept, or hard for them to find ease with, with what has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you bring yourself to where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those that when a matter has been decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well you said taslima, like they just surrender to it. This is what Allah has decreed. Like there is no choice for them in this matter. Meaning whatever they feel, whatever is hard for them, when it comes to what has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they try to submit themselves to it and they don't say, maybe it's this way, maybe it's that, that, that way and so on. The other thing is that a person has the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like from the way that we should be with Allah is that we fear Him. And also the way that we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have hope in Him. Because without these two things, a person is going to go, like if you don't have both of them at the same time, you will be destroyed, right? A person that is filled with the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has no hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shaitan will come to him and convince him, your deeds at the end of the day, they don't matter. Your deeds are not enough for what you have done, for who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. While at the same time shaitan is coming and telling you this, he himself acknowledges the fact that he fears Allah. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about you know, shaitan, Iblis, what he does to the disbelievers. He brings them to where he wants them to do. 
Then when he, whenever he gets to that place, he's like, "Inni akhaf Allah Rabb al I fear the Lord, you know, of, of 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 everything. Then I see things that you don't see. So peace out. Right? You go your way. <laughs> I am going back, even though I brought you here. So he will convince you if you have so much fear of it, you will never be able to attain the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And a person that has hope of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala only and no fear. He is going to eventually think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is Ar-Rahman and He is Ar-Rahim. Then there's no reason for Him to do anything. Why pray Salah? Why fast the month of Ramadan? Why have good akhlaq? When Allah is Ar-Rahim and He is Al-Ghafoor and He's eventually going to forgive me. How could He not? And this is why whenever you look at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it never comes by itself. It always comes with the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An easy example for us to understand this is, we recite Surah Al-Fatiha 17 times a day, hopefully. <coughs> if we recite it that many times, one of the names of Allah that we get accustomed to or used to right away, it is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Right? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim to begin the Surah, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, and then Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, and then Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. So then comes the question, where is the adab that is being mentioned here? Where is the punishment for the people to like, to have this, you're being told mercy twice, now you have this here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what's the next verse? Maliki yawmiddin. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the Malik, He is the one that is in possession, He is the controller of yawmiddin. And yawmiddin means the day that everyone is going to be paid back for what they've done. So you have like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling you, yes, He is a Rahman and He is a Rahim. But remember that He is also Maliki Yawmiddin. That you just thinking Allah is a Rahman and a Rahim will not be enough for you. Because at the end of the day, you have to stand in front of Him. And He has sent you the manual for you to do it. So a believer, He always has these two states within Him. He always sees that Allah is merciful. Allah is merciful. But also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fastest one to punish the people. Right? Like this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself inside of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, ibadi anni and al ghafurur rahim Inform my servants that I am indeed al ghafur and al rahim What's the next verse? What's the next part of it that comes? Wa anna adabi. Like in the same verse. Forget telling you like the next verse. In the same verse, tell them, my servants. I am the most merciful, the most pardoning, the most forgiven. But don't forget to remind them that I am also the one that has the worst type of punishment. The worst punishment that could be afflicted to a people comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person always has these two etiquettes and manners when he's dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, our bodies are like that of a bird. We have a wing of hope and a wing of fear. Without both of them, you know, flapping together at the same time, we will go nowhere. If we try to just flap with hope, we go nowhere. If we try to flap with fear, we go nowhere. But a person that understands, I have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I also have to have hope in Him, the bird is eventually going to begin flying. And if you look at the, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them with having this quality. Not just them, even the malaika, this is how they're described. Of them having the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Anbiya, after telling us about the prophets, he says, وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ That they used to have the fear of us. Right? They used to have the fear. And this is talking about the prophets. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in an authentic hadith, he tells us, أَمَا إِنِّي أَعْلَمُكُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَأَخْشَاكُمْ لِلَّهِ That I am the one that knows about Allah the most. And the one that fears Him the most. So if this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one that is promised Jannah, not only the promised Jannah, right? He is the one that is promised Al-Maqam Al-Mahmood, a place above Jannah, a place above Jannah. He knows that. He knows that this is his position. So why should he have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It doesn't make sense to us. Why should you fear? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, like he just told you, you have the best of akhlaq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told, not only you, but as a virtue of you, your companions, all of them get Jannah. So why is there a fear from them? From the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And not just regular fear. But no one will come from this ummah, before him or after him, that will fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa While at the same time having hope 
in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had so much hope, so much hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And you see it in the way that he would make dua, in the way that he would call on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from this hope, you and I are here. Right? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made so much dua. He made so much dua. The du'as of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, today they've reached to you and I. Right? How have they reached us? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say, Ya Allah, do not destroy my ummah. Do not destroy my ummah. Meaning like the ways of the, of like the different prophets that came before, do not destroy them like that. You know the time between the, like the messengers and the different prophets that would come after them, it is not a long time, like 1400 years, right? You go from the time of Musa alayhi salam to Isa, there was never a breakage in prophethood. Prophets were always there. The people always had their prophets. Then you go from there, Isa alayhi salam comes, then there's a gap of how long between Isa and our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Huh? 570, 570 years before the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? This is the breakage that is there, meaning that a people should be destroyed, should have turned away from the religion of their messenger by this time. But today, this is the year 1445, after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, making it 1458, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent as a prophet. Right, so if he asked Allah to, for his ummah not to be destroyed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he answers his dua and he says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ That Allah will never punish them, will not, meaning like, they will never be completely destroyed for as long as you are with them. For as long as you are with them. Then you come to, how about the rest of us? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is not with us. So is this guarantee still there? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa complained to Allah about those that are going to come after him. Yes, the my ummah, like my, his community, his companions will not be destroyed for as long as he's there. But what about the, the rest of the believers that are going to come? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say to answer this request of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What does he say? مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah said, then the promise from Allah is Allah will not punish us, will not punish the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for as long as they continue to make istighfar. And this is like from the hope that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. We have lived as, a gener as an ummah of a Prophet longer than all of the other people that, that have followed their messenger. Right? L way longer than them. Why? Because of the hope that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had in, the mess in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that the messenger had in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered it for him in this way. So this is one of the qualities that we should be having when it comes to how we deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing is that a believer, a believer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has a tawakkul with him. That he's always relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He understands that ultimately in this life, in this life, there is no guarantees that are ex like you can really count on outside of the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like one of the things we constantly say when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us like about himself, he says uh, like about himself, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never breaks the promises or never like not fulfills the oath that he has taken or the, like the promises that he has made. So a person always has tawakkul on him. One of the, like, if anything you worry about, right? Anything that you worry about in this life, whatever it might be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed it for you. So a person that is always relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands that no matter what happens, Allah got me. Allah has decreed everything from the beginning to the end. And it was, it's not decreed based on what I have done, the deeds that I do, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that what this took place when you and I were 40 days in the wombs of our mother. I had nothing to do in there to decide, am I a good person, therefore I should get this much risk? 
Am I a good person? Therefore, my life should be this way. Or the things that I want should come to me at this. No. In that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for you everything that is going to happen. From how long you are going to live. From what type of risk you are going to have. From what type of deeds you're going to do. All the way to what are you actually going to be in the hereafter. May Allah make us from those that are happy. May Allah make us from those that are blessed on that day. Right? So all of this is there. If a believer knows this, then it is a requirement for him to always rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the most difficult of times, he remembers, Allah is my Lord. You know, one of the righteous people before us, he, he made a statement to his students. And he said, you know, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers my dua, I am happy and I am pleased. But whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not answer my dua, I am pleased 10 times over. So they said, how is that possible? That you ask Allah for something, He gives it to you and you're happy. But if Allah holds it back or doesn't give you what you want, you're 10 times happier. He said, because when I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm asking Him and I'm saying, give me this, or in the cases of most of you, give me her or him, right? <laughs> give me her or him. And he gives it to you, you say, you know what? This is what I asked for. But when Allah holds back, I asked for something, Allah said no. He didn't say no because he didn't want good for me. But he said no because in his wisdom, he knows that this is not good for me. He said, how can I not be happier? I was standing during the nights and the days begging Allah to give me something. And through his mercy, he held it back from me. Even though he told us that there's a promise for the one that makes dua, his duas are going to be answered. Right? Allah says, just call on to me and he will answer the duas. All we have to do is ask. So how could I stand during the days and nights and make this dua? And Allah has prevented it from me. Right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the love that he has for you, and what he wants from you, and what's best for you, decided this is not for you. So he says, that's why whenever I ask and I'm prevented, I'm 10 times happier. So a person always relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And understands again, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that is more merciful to us than our mothers, the one that loves us more than our mothers, he is the one that is in charge of our affairs. From the moments that we wake up until we return to him, and then eventually until we return to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it all good for us. The other thing that a person needs to have, Right, is we live in this life of fitna, of trials and tribulation, of calamities. This was never a life that we were told we're going to enjoy ourselves here. We are going to enjoy ourselves here. This was not a promise that was made to us. The opposite was told to our father. The opposite. He was told, la that this place that you are in, you're not going to feel thirsty. You will not feel thirsty. Nor are you going to feel hungry. Like hunger is not going to come to you. Thirst is not going to come to you. Tiredness is not going to come to you. This is where you're from. Jannah. And this is what you have. Do not leave it. Do not leave it. And then he says, فَتَشْقَى So then you just, every kala you're going to, all of the things that Jannah had for you, you're going to give it up for hardships. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already told our father that us in this life are going to have hardships. So this is the place for it. So how is a believer when those times actually come? A believer with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has patience. He has sabr. Right? One of the best ways for a person to attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whenever a calamity comes to them, the first statement that comes out of their mouth, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That we all belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are from Him. Eventually we are going to back, go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I should be away, like I should have patience in this time that has come to me. In this calamity that has come to me. As the poet said, there are nine conditions that, the, that human beings have to go through and no one is ever going to escape them. He says you will have times of happiness and times of sadness. Times of sickness and times of health. Times of richness and times of poverty. And you will have times of ease and times of hardship. You're never going to go away from these times. You will be in one of these two places. But the believer when he's going from one place to another, he has patience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he loves the people that are patient. 
those that are going to get their full reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those that were patient. So a believer, whenever a calamity comes to them, whenever a trial comes, they never think, they never think that why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing this to me? Why am I the one that is going through it? Why am I this and this and this and this is happening? You know, if you and I were given the lives of Nuh alayhi salam or his people, and we were able to control our fate in those thousand years that we lived. Meaning, I decreed for myself entire happiness. No, not a single moment of sadness in those thousand years that I was here. And then eventually we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first time that the grave squeezes a person, everything in this dunya they're going to forget. Right? And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, think about death often. Because if you think about it and you are in a situation that is constricted, a situation that has brought hardship to you, a, like you feel like I cannot get out of it, you think of death and you remember one day I'm going to leave this. And when I leave it, I'm going to a different place. So I should have patience while doing it. And when a person, the dunya has been opened to them, everything that they desire has been given to them. In those moments, think about death. Because eventually you're going to leave this. So you have to prepare yourself for that moment that the, that the grave squeezes you. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, he says, every single comforting hug that a person has ever had in this life, the first time that the grave hugs him and squeezes him, he's going to forget it. He's not going to remember. And if this is the case, it means whenever calamities come to you, you have patience, you have sabr. Whether it is a calamity that is affecting you personally, whether it is, like example, you losing a job, or example, you not being able to find a spouse, or example, you are married and unable to have children. Whatever trial it might be, your schooling not going the way that you want it to go, you looking for jobs going not, not going the way that you want it to go, or if it is a calamity that is impacting the entire community, or a calamity that is impacting the ummah, like what we see with our brothers and sisters in Libya and Morocco and everywhere. May Allah make it easy for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify their affairs and elevate them and forgive them. A per, even in those moments, a person has patience. He relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he understands that eventually we are all going to go back to him. And you remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring ala ru'us al-khala'iq, like uh, in front of every single person. The person that had the worst of lives and the person that had the best of lives. Is that the other? That's the other? Okay. Do, do we have time after Adhan or no? Do we have some time? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says they will be brought in front of the people. When they are brought, the one that had the worst fate, meaning like Allah decreed for this person to suffer the most. He'll be put into Jannah for a moment and he'll be taken out and he'll be asked, did you feel any discomfort before? Again, this is the one that Allah has tested the most. He says, Wallahi, I have never felt a moment of discomfort. Meaning that first, just that moment that he was in Jannah made him forget all of the things that he went through in this dunya. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the one that had the best of lives. You think about enjoyment, you think about like whatever you want, this person had it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take him and put him into the fire for a moment and take him out. And he'll be asked, have you enjoyed a moment in your life? He says, wallahi, I've not enjoyed a single moment. Again, the one that Allah blessed with the best of lives. He is not going to remember any of it. Even if we were to live a thousand years like Nuh. This is a, a place of forever and ever and ever. So when calamities come, they come for a very short time. And it is impossible for a person not to go through life without calamities. Calamities, they are part of life. This is how Allah created this dunya. So when those come to you, your mannerisms with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is you have patience. And patience, right? it doesn't mean that when you reach a point where you can't do nothing but have patience, you decide, now I'm going to have patience. No. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, sabr عند sadmatil ula, that patience comes at the first strike of calamity. 
when he told the mother that lost her child and she was sta like standing on top of the grave of the child and she's crying. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes and tells her to be patient. And she says, get away from me. You don't know the state that I am in. Like you don't know my suffering. You cannot tell, uh, one minute, you cannot tell me to be patient. And she does, like her sadness, she does not realize that it was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leaves her. And then if someone tells me, how could you say that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So she goes, she says, if I knew that it was you, my reaction would not have been the same. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling her, this is not the time to have patience. The time for you to have patience was when this calamity first hit you. That is when you say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And you comfort yourself that this is the life of everybody. So a person with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his mannerisms and etiquettes is that he has patience with the qada and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for shortcomings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.